Okay, we will now begin our broadcast. Welcome to this discussion on COVID-19, a gender perspective on the growing humanitarian crisis. I'm Milan Verveer, the director of the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security. We are so pleased to be able to host this discussion with a group of very dedicated and distinguished leaders in this field who will provide us their perspective on the challenges our world confronts today. We are also grateful to our co-sponsors from the Consortium of Women, Peace and Security Centers and Institutes, the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping and Training Center, the London School of Economics Center for Women, Peace and Security, the Monash University Gender, Peace and Security Center, and the Peace and Security, the Research Institute at Oslo, its Center for Gender, Peace and Security. While COVID-19 does not discriminate in whom it attacks, women bear a heavy price as frontline health workers and as the primary caregivers under very, very difficult conditions. They are also sustaining severe economic hardships and they are in greater danger of domestic abuse. The toll on them is particularly great in fragile or conflict affected states, in the desperate humanitarian settings among refugees. That said, they are also central to the fight against COVID-19. Our panel will grapple with these concerns. We have almost 3,000 viewers today on the line from all over the world, from Ireland to Jordan, from Colombia to Iraq, to Hong Kong and so many places in between. Each of you can ask your questions, can put your questions uh, before us. You will have an opportunity to submit them to the speakers throughout this event. We ask that you use the Q&A feature on your screens, the question and answer feature. And when you submit your question, please list your name and your organization and to whom your question is directed. I'm gonna turn now to opening remarks from David Miliband. David is the president and CEO of the International Rescue Committee. He oversees the agency's humanitarian relief operations in some of the worst humanitarian crises. And IRC helps to restore the well being of people devastated by conflict and disaster. He earlier served as the Foreign Minister of the United Kingdom. David, last year at Georgetown, you launched the IRC's feminist humanitarian policy. I hope that in your remarks and opening up this discussion today, you can talk a little about how you are incorporating this policy in the COVID-19 crisis. I also know that uh, IRC and CARE issued some key findings uh, last week uh, in your global rapid, rapid gender analysis. And hopefully you can integrate uh, some of those findings in what you will now tell us. So I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Milan. Thank you for your amazing leadership. Thank you to Georgetown and your partners for convening this a session. And I am very much today the voice of the women who work in our organization. Uh, you said that our job is to grapple with very difficult problems. And that's what I'm going to try to reflect, both the grappling and some of the solutions that have been developed by my colleagues in 200 field sites around the world, uh, working in some of the most war-torn uh, parts of the world uh, across the arc of crisis, from Syria in Idlib, uh, from Somalia, 
uh, from South Sudan, uh, right through to refugee transit routes, and then to our field offices in the US and um, in Europe. Uh, and perhaps I should explain, um, I am not in New York City at the moment, the headquarters of the um, International Rescue Committee. Um, with my family, I am in Connecticut, where we have um, taken, uh, we went to the small place. That's why it looks like I'm in a um, some kind of old English cottage. I'm not um, uh, in Connecticut. Um, and the noise that you hear downstairs is homeschooling. So I apologize for that in um, advance. Um, let me just start with the central cl claim that we uh, make in this debate. And the claim is a simple one. It's that however bad, and it is bad, uh, the situation is in advanced industrialized countries, notably in the West, um, the crisis um, places in much graver danger uh, people in, who are living in places without advanced water or sanitation or health systems. And then that within that group of vulnerable populations, uh, be they refugees, IDPs, internally displaced, or host communities, women and girls are not just likely to suffer, they are suffering two or three times over during this uh, crisis. There's one uh, additional element of context that I want to uh, give, which is that in many of the places that we work, I am doing five or six um, huddles with our teams around the world each week, um, most recently, Jordan, Cameroon, Cote d'Ivoire. Um, the crisis has not yet hit in these humanitarian emergencies with the virulence that it's hit in places like New York City. And so um, we have to stress in our remarks the preventative work that we are doing, as well as uh, the reactive uh, work. Now, as you uh, said and indicated, COVID doesn't strike the genders equally. And so the response to COVID needs to reflect that reality and adjust accordingly. Uh, at Georgetown last year, I said, as you referenced, that recognizing the way unequal power structures affect life chances is the heart of feminist analysis. And argued, I argued that it was vital that we take into account these power structures in constructing adequate and effective humanitarian response. And that's what we're trying to do. And it's what I want to refer to uh, today. I think there are some critical lessons from previous outbreaks that are warnings about how the global community can um, misreact, fail to react, and too many of them are um, in evidence again. Um, what I want to do is just highlight the four, four dangers, because I think it's important to see them separately, notwithstanding the, the relationship they have with each other. And then uh, some of the things that we're doing and that we think others can do uh, better if we are to protect and empower the women and girls who both we employ and we seek to serve. Just in terms of the dangers, just to rehearse them uh, as I was asked to do um, for context. First, we know that caregiving falls disproportionately, the burden of caregiving falls disproportionately on women. So the, and that's both a caregiving in the home and professional caregiving in nursing and other uh, situations. The danger of the virus falls especially on women. Globally, women are 70% of the global health workforce. They perform three quarters of the total hours of unpaid care work, more in some uh, cases. During the Ebola outbreak, we saw that women and girls were two thirds of the, those who contracted the disease because of their increased exposure through their caring responsibilities. And we also found that often those women and girls were then stigmatized um, if they fell ill or if their family members fell ill, with their cleanliness, for example, called into question. Second, we know that, and you referenced the care, the report we did with care, we know that GBV, gender-based violence, and intimate partner violence is rising and is likely to rise. As with most humanitarian disasters, that's what happens. Disease outbreaks have been shown to lead to increased experiences of violence against both women and girls. Our um, rapid assessment in China, interestingly enough, showed that GBV increased there. Uh, just last week, the Secretary General of the UN, Antonio Guterres, rightly highlighted the quote unquote horrifying surge in domestic violence around the world as women who were trapped in their homes um, were abused by their partners. In France, interestingly, um, there is an, apparently a nationwide 30% increase in domestic violence. Third, the danger of sexual and reproductive health risks. Uh, women and girls continue to need to access sexual and reproductive health services, obviously, 
But as health providers are overwhelmed, the danger is that they don't get the access they need to the qualified uh, support that is necessary. In Sierra Leone, during the Ebola outbreak, interestingly enough, uh, one study estimated there were an additional 3,500 maternal deaths, neonatal deaths, and stillbirths related to the decrease in health service utilization during the 2014 Ebola outbreak. At the same time in Sierra Leone, teenage pregnancy rose. So you can see the risks. And fourthly, and linked to the previous three, economic vulnerability. Because women are more likely to work in the informal sector, they're less likely to have the safety net support that is so uh, important and in some cases is being advanced. Um, I, I was asked to speak briefly, so let me run through quickly what we think is uh, necessary. Much of this is very uh, basic, but it's important. Um, first, uh, gender balanced COVID response uh, teams. Uh, we're working very hard to achieve that in our own organization. I haven't seen much reference to that uh, globally, but we know from experience how important it is. Secondly, um, data remains absolutely key and transparency of data is a vital first step to getting the services that women and girls need. The gender disaggregation of data is a fundamental stepping stone to any kind of effective uh, response. Thirdly, it's tragic that gender-based violence is still seen as some kind of luxury in humanitarian uh, response. It didn't get the profile that it deserved in the UN appeal that was launched uh, two weeks ago. And I remain um, deeply frustrated uh, about the way in which priority is not given uh, to uh, issues of gender-based violence in humanitarian settings. And it remains uh, too often an afterthought in the uh, response um, here. Uh, fourthly, um, program adaptation. We are pivoting all of our programs to be COVID um, sensitive and COVID proofed where they can be. Um, that's not just about health services, it's also about cash distribution services, it's about education services, it's about child and women's protection um, uh, services. And we can get into that in the discussion, uh, but it's not good enough to say that because person-to-person uh, -person contact is not uh, possible, psychosocial services, for example, can't be delivered. Um, they can be using hotlines, using referrals, using other techniques. Um, fifthly, we've made our, uh, IRC's International Rescue Committee's three-point plan for responding to COVID put staff safety first. Uh, we, uh, that's for the obvious reason that we have responsibilities to our own staff, 30,000 uh, employees and auxiliary workers around the world but also because we know of how um, central they are to the services that we deliver. Uh, that support for staff needs to include things like extra leave for uh, staff who have child caring responsibilities because the school's closed. So there's a gender dimension to that uh, too. Um, sixthly, I am concerned that in the rush to address local problems, it's not just that there's a lack of international leadership. I'm worried that there'll be a syndrome of what we sometimes call robbing Peter to pay Paul, which is maybe not the right way of putting it. But if you think about it, the danger is that money for COVID is taken from existing humanitarian programs rather than seen as additional uh, to it. And it would be uh, worse than a tragedy if this outbreak was an excuse to divert resources away from programs for women and girls or programs that are benefiting women and girls. We need uh, COVID to rally additional international support. And frankly, I have a worry uh, that the $2 billion UN appeal um, was way too small. I mean, it sounded like a large amount, but it's way too small given the scale of the uh, crisis. And I mean, there are other issues which we can discuss about the balance of the funding in that. Only $100 million was reserved for NGOs in that, um, in that, uh, in that appeal. And uh, the International Rescue Committee itself has a $30 million appeal for us to spend uh, in the next um, eight weeks. Um, uh, final uh, point that I want to uh, register, which is that um, frontline first has got to mean be more than rhetoric in the response to this uh, crisis. Frontline first means local people being agents of their own protection. It means local NGOs being partners of international NGOs so that we get the best of both. Uh, it means the um, bureaucratic systems that are in place for business as usual uh, do not uh, impede the response to the crisis because uh, there's a grave danger that women and girls suffer doubly and trebly 
uh, because of a failure to adapt to the severity and the speed of this crisis. Um, let me just end, Milan, by uh, saying that um, this is obviously no way to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Women's Conference. Many of us thought that this would be recognized in a different way. Um, the outbreak of the crisis, to me, um, dem dramatizes the limits to progress since Beijing uh, 25 years ago. And I think we have to use this crisis to demonstrate the ways in which the world can make more progress in the next 25 years, if it is to fulfill the central claims of the Beijing conference and the speeches made there. I'm looking forward to the discussion, um, Milan, very much uh, looking forward to listening to the fellow panelists. I'm humbled by the people that uh, you have assembled uh, today. And I uh, very much want to emphasize that I, I, I um, am here to represent the views of many, many women who are part of our organization and have made representations uh, about the need for the kind of gender dimension in this crisis that you're trying to explain. Thanks very much indeed. Well, thank you so much, David, and thank you for that uh, itemization of various responses from resources to composition of the frontline teams to um, the emphasis on, on gender-based violence that needs to be better understood, um, and fundamentally the, uh, the inequalities that continue to exist and should motivate all of us to once and for all try to uh, fully address uh, I'm going to turn now to Anita Bhatia, who's the Assistant Secretary General and Deputy Executive Director of UN Women. Uh, she oversees uh, resources management, sustainability partnerships, and more. Uh, she most recently held various positions with the World Bank, including uh, her last position there as Director of Global Partnerships at the International Finance Corporation. And Anita, I want you to expand some on what David said, particularly um, looking at the different impacts uh, that this disease has uh, on women and how it hits hardest uh, in the developing and conflict uh, affected places where they are uh, the most vulnerable. Uh, what are you learning from the global UN Women's Network uh, about the situation on the ground. And um, perhaps you can expand some on what David said about gender-based violence um, and, and leave us hopefully with some recommendations as well uh, to add to his um, in terms of uh, advice to policymakers and activists. So please. Thank you, Milan. A uh, great pleasure to be on this panel with everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. So actually, let me start with Beijing, because as David uh, said so eloquently, you know, this was supposed to be the year of celebration. 2020 was the year we were going to celebrate uh, what we have achieved since Beijing, but also look back and see where the big gaps were. This is the year we're celebrating the 20th anniversary of Resolution 1325, giving women a role in women, peace and security. So this was to be a flagship year. We were going to have a huge generation equality event, one in Mexico, one in Paris, and then along came COVID. And I think I've said to you before, Milan, that even before we were getting ready to celebrate, reflect, and renew commitments um, through generation equality, my sense of where we are and our sense of what uh, has been achieved since Beijing is that at, even in 2020, we are running to stay in place. There simply hasn't been enough progress made on gender equality and women's empowerment. And then along comes COVID and what COVID has shown and what COVID has thrown into sharp relief is to, I think a number of things, but first, how COVID is impacting women and girls worldwide varies very much depending on where you are, because in the developing world, it is first and foremost a health crisis, uh, an economic crisis, and then a health crisis. Very different to what has happened in Europe and the US, where it is a public health crisis first and an economic crisis second. And when you add to that, 
the particular dimensions of the crisis in crisis conflict affected states or conflict affected regions, you really have the makings of what could be uh, and is turning out to be possibly a catastrophe. I think there's no other word for it. And I think we really have to be mindful that we are at the point where if we do not intervene very purposefully, we are going to see some very ugly and very, I mean, really awful situations on the ground. So let me say what we are hearing from our network of civil society partners and women's organizations on the ground. And let me share some of the findings of these huddles that we have been having with civil society organizations all over the world. So the Women, Peace and uh, Humanitarian Fund undertook a survey of our local CSO partners. And what we have learned is first of all, many of these organizations actually fear for their very existence. They are worried about actually being uh, decimated financially, organizationally, and actually they are worried about survival. We also know that most uh, CSOs are finding that women's groups are not able to have the influence that they should in policy making and decision making. They do not have a seat at the table. And we can see this. Every time you turn on the television, there are men speaking about the pandemic. And we need to make attempts to make sure that women are actually at the table influencing decision making. There are four particular areas that we're very concerned about. One, David referred to this already, what is the rate of infection in frontline workers? How are women being uh, impacted by having such a disproportionate role in the provision of care? And we need data around this, we need sex disaggregated data. So I'm very happy to say that UN Women has been working with WHO to publish sex disaggregated data, and it is now on our website. It went live yesterday, so I encourage everybody to go and take a look at it. We need to put this out there because without data, there are just anecdotal stories. We need to create the evidence base for the differential impact on women. Second, I am very concerned about the economic impact uh, on women, particularly in crisis situations. And here, what I think we can do is that every country now has a stimulus package that it is negotiating with the IMF and with the bank. The IMF, uh, I learned yesterday, has a record number of countries coming to it for help, 95. I think this is 10 times the number of countries that came to the fund during the um, uh, financial crisis in 2008. So we need to actually take a look at these stimulus packages and see how are we directing resources to women in the neediest, uh, in, 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 um, in crisis communities, because some of these programs, let's say conditional cash transfers, right? What are we discussing with policymakers that will enable them to waive some of these conditions so that money can actually flow into the hands of the women who need it the most. And here, I think, for example, with, for example, with conditional cash transfers, there are often conditions around keeping children in school to get money. So we need to ask policymakers to actually waive those conditions and make sure women are getting money. Number three, we actually need to make sure that we are paying attention to this issue of unpaid care, because in a sense, we have a golden opportunity to put on the table policy proposals that will address this issue in a way that they haven't been able to do, because you are now seeing with people at home that this burden of care is actually very visible in a way that it hadn't been before. And finally, I do want to say something about the issue of domestic violence. I mean, domestic violence is what we are calling a shadow pandemic. It has actually been a pandemic all along. It has not received enough attention in humanitarian contexts and crisis contexts. And the only way it is going to do that is if, again, in our dialogue with policymakers, we are asking for a number of things. Number one, we're asking for shelters to be designated as essential services. We are asking for support to keep hotlines open. We are asking that law enforcement and police be sensitized to the issues of domestic violence in crisis situations. And we are asking that this is something that policymakers speak about.
Tomorrow, the Secretary General will release the United Nations report on the impact of gender, uh, on the impact of COVID on gender. It speaks to the issues of unpaid care, of domestic violence, of health impacts, and of economic impacts. And we think it is absolutely vital that there be a particular attention paid to conflict and crisis affected situations because most of these places have decimated health systems, very few opportunities for employment for women already, uh, shadow instances, unreported instances of domestic violence and burgeoning burdens of unpaid care. So all of the issues that we see, uh, all of the, the main areas of impact of COVID on women are amplified uh, in crisis situations. So the only way we're gonna be able to address this is if in our dialogue with governments and by the way, with private sector partners, we are bringing attention to, the, to these issues in a way that is solution oriented. I'm hopeful, actually, that because the issue of domestic violence, for instance, has received so much attention in the last few weeks, that we might actually get to a point where post-pandemic, we can also declare domestic violence itself a pandemic, a public health issue, and that we will be able to focus policymakers' attention on this in a way that we haven't been able to before. And one last point, and that is, on the targeting of programs, right? Because if we can say to a policymaker, in the stimulus package, we want you to think about how is this money going to women? Targeting is actually very difficult. So we actually have to think through, how are we implementing? How are we monitoring? Are we making sure that something that looks pro-women, particularly pro-women in crisis situations, turns out to be pro-women in implementation? So monitoring is key. And number two, reallocation of expenditures is absolutely critical. Why do countries spend as much as they do on defense? Let's now start a dialogue around, can we reduce defense expenditures and can we move some of these both to public health issues as well as to other issues, including stimulus packages that reach women? I'll stop there. Well, thank you very much, uh, Anita. And thank you for those very uh, concrete uh, suggestions, and I, I think your point, uh, many good points, but the point uh, that uh, while women's organizations are particularly vulnerable now, uh, we are also seeing, despite the need for women's critical agency, uh, that they're not at the decision-making tables. They're not participating uh, in decisions that affect them and, and everyone around them. Uh, so I think that and, and the way that you expanded on um, the scourge that domestic violence is, maybe once and for all, we'll um, begin to look at it for what it represents. Uh, so let me move now uh, to um, Dr. Orzola Nimat, who was an activist and scholar. Uh, but before I do that, let me remind our viewers uh, to submit their questions. I see a number are coming in, uh, but to please submit them uh, in writing. Uh, Orzola Nimat is the first female director of the Afghanistan Research and Evaluation Unit. Uh, it is the leading independent research organization in Kabul. Earlier, she was uh, an advisor to the president on subnational governance, and she's held a number of important positions. Orzola, take us to Afghanistan. Um, what is happening? Uh, it is a country that has been besieged by the war and the ongoing violence, a humanitarian crisis. Uh, certainly that's been going on for a long time now. And on top of that, you have to confront uh, COVID-19. Uh, what is the impact? How extensive is it? Uh, and if perhaps you could, uh, in, in the, at the end of your uh, remarks, also uh, say a little bit about the peace process that there have been great expectations uh, would be starting uh, fairly soon and how that's being impacted as well. Uh, so Orzola, thank you for being here and uh, please take it away. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Milan. Uh, good day, everyone. Um, I hope everyone can hear me well. 
yeah, perfect. Uh, well, uh, uh, I think what I would like to start with um, um, uh, as a general sort of remark is to highlight the fact that COVID-19 as often uh, portrayed as a health issue or a health-related pandemic uh, uh, is also causing some issues in terms of, you know, the planning and the preparedness of countries. And I'm pleased to hear from different uh, pa distinguished panelists before me uh, about uh, how uh, the responses have uh, faced challenges across different countries. So. Uh, in the case of Afghanistan um, um, as well, this is uh, not only uh, um, a health um, issue, this pandemic, it is a social issue, it's uh, a deeply economic issue. Uh, it also highlights some challenges we face in terms of governance and planning the responses. And at the same time, it's a security issue. Uh, because in the midst of uh, responses uh, to this uh, pandemic in the country. We have been facing, uh, unfortunately, a war that is not anyone's desire to see it continued. And unfortunately, a complete failure of uh, any demand towards a ceasefire uh, and uh, a, a real and lasting peace. So uh, to just sort of start uh, here uh, on, on the responses in Afghanistan for this, uh, first of all, uh, Afghanistan for a long time did not have any uh, reported cases. Uh, it's very important to mention because reported cases means nobody was uh, initially registered to, with, uh, with, the, with the coronavirus, diagnosed with the coronavirus. But of course we have deaths due to health problems frequently that uh, there are no data and no records of that. So it started to increase uh, significantly uh, when uh, um, Afghan refugees from Iran uh, moved, uh, and Iran had one of the highest numbers of casualties for this uh, pandemic uh, at the earlier days. So uh, uh, returnees from Iran has uh, actually became the, the main um, sort of uh, um, bringers of, of the virus in the country. And of course, uh, the, then slowly, because the returnees are coming and they mainly uh, now the highest number of corona cases are in Herat, western province of Afghanistan, and that tells us uh, on how this is really a fact that uh, uh, the main source has and main source of traveling is is, is Iran. Uh, following to Iran and most of the western provinces, central uh, highlands have also been uh, massively affected because again a lot of people from central highland also migrated to Iran for work. And now we see the cases and spots across the country increasing on every day. At least uh, one thing that is positive is uh, number of cases being reported. Uh, uh, what I see problematic is again the challenge with data. I have tried uh, to, to use my networks within the uh, health organizations and the government to find out how much data we are gathering because I'm following the global news about the pandemic and I see that there are challenges globally even when it comes to sort of a gender desegregated data uh, or not only gender but age as well. Uh, it's I think evident also in the case of Afghanistan where we just have numbers of this number of people so far affected, this number of people uh, uh, sort of made it uh, to a healthy life again and uh, some have not. Um, that's like one, one, uh, one uh, point to highlight. Um, another fact which is very unfortunate is again uh, uh, this uh, sort of uh, lack of uh, capacity or very low capacity in our health services. So imagine in the most advanced and developed, uh, developed world, this is a challenge and everyone is looking at it as a health crisis uh, or public health crisis. So in a country where there are three doctors for 10,000 people. Uh, and those three doctors for 10,000 people are not necessarily female doctors. If we count the female doctors, it's maybe rare. There are provinces as a whole. We have 34 provinces in Afghanistan and there are at least two provinces with at least or maybe one or two doctors as a whole. For a, a country with a population of 37 million, uh, this is really uh, uh, sort of... Uh, drastic. And yesterday, yesterday or day before yesterday, we had also 
or one of the first uh, uh, casualties among the doctors, a doctor in a private health clinic in Kabul, uh, unfortunately passed away due to coronavirus. Looking at the picture of this doctor, uh, you could see that there are no any preventative uh, gadgets or you know equipments uh, that could help the, the, the staff. They are wearing something like plastic, which is not really uh, uh, a, a standard, you know, uh, equipment or a standard, a standard protective uh, um, tools that can help them. So, if a doctor, so following to this sad and tragic news of a doctor losing his life in one of the top, one of the second or third top uh, best hospitals in Kabul, the capital, uh, uh, the hospital had to close down because uh, uh, six percent of its staff are already affected. Uh, so I'm, I'm sort of sitting here in as a sort of social scientist thinking about uh, or observing the situation and saying like we are, besides like trying to highlighting the, the, the risks and trying to convince people to take this serious, I mean there are hashtags social media wise saying take it serious, take it serious. Okay, now people take it so serious that there is not only the virus itself and it's affecting, there is also this fear because people are so terrified that there are news of some, even officials, as it says, that they are tested positive and they turn off their mobiles, they don't respond, they don't accept to be quarantined, they don't accept, so they affect directly people. And we have had, you know, like everyone else in the world, we have had all these campaigns of staying home and doing self-isolation and all that, but let me tell you this. Over 70% of the population are living in rural areas, and even in urban areas. Uh, an average house, Afghan, and I, this probably I'm talking about Afghanistan, but it's also applying to many other similar countries in a deep poverty affected by war and all of that. Uh, we ha an average family in Afghanistan is eight people, six children and parents. And let me tell you, not, not in, in, in a household, not usually a, a unit, a nuclear family lives. They are extended families. So at least there are 15 to 20 to 20 plus people are living in the same household. People to self-quarantine at the household level is impossible in Afghanistan because the, there are no facilities. People don't have that luxury of having separate houses, separate rooms in the houses. So the quarantine thing can only work uh, uh, within the community context, which I think uh, uh, the, the, the country has been slow in, in bringing uh, this responsibility to the local community leaders as someone who looked at the as sort of subnational governance and local governance in Afghanistan. I, I've actually used my networks to highlight the importance of not taking everything on your own shoulders as government. So I reached out to my government uh, counterparts and in, uh, sort of informed them that this is not their responsibility. In terms of prevention, it's not their responsibility to take everything on their shoulders. So they rather have to involve the local uh, urban, uh, we call it Wakila Gozar, like the urban uh, community leaders and also the rural community leaders to take care of uh, and to share the responsibility. And in terms of quarantines in isolations, there is much stronger approach needed to be applied. A stronger doesn't mean something horrifying and completely against human rights, but at least something that is more community-based rather than, you know, uh, family-based. Uh, that I, I think is uh, important. So, um, uh, in in unfortunately, um, uh, another challenge we just faced uh, in the past two days. Yes, since yesterday. Uh, there was a long preparation by bordering areas uh, with Pakistan where uh, there was an agreement that, okay, let's open the borders for three days because there has been a massive, you know, the mobility between the borders is, is quite massive in, in Afghanistan. So unfortunately, these were not sort of respected by both sides. And then there were like 25,000 people, you know, coming uh, and crowding the borders and, uh, and passing at the same time. We, we understand the des desperate need of people to move and make, move, you know, move from one side to another. There are lots of dependencies from health to economy to everything. But then uh, uh, if there is no a regional approach to this, particularly within the neighborhoods of the countries, uh, it will make it even worse. We are not 
Europe to just make people go back home and wait for a few days here. Uh, people are deeply connected. People have deep poverty. They cannot afford staying in another country. And in, in case of, for example, Iran, there are news that some, 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 some people were forced to leave as soon as they were uh, taken, picked up from the streets as uh, Afghan refugees. So that cannot be verified, but at least it's something that is coming out uh, uh, based on the, the uh, personal anecdotes. So, um, now that brings us to, to the, the, the issue of violence. Um, in, a, in an ideal situation, when a pandemic like this hitting the entire globe is happening, I mean, the first thing that comes in everyone's mind is that, well, let's, in order to focus on this pandemic and responses to this pandemic, let's at least have one worry uh, addressed, uh, which is the war and violence. So the Afghan security forces now are basically uh, trying to imply the, 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 uh, the, 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 the pandemic response in terms of you know, lockdowns and controlling the borders and controlling the people population's mobility. At the same time, they are uh, also uh, responsible for the overall security. Last week, we had a tragic incident attacks on one of the most noble uh, minorities in Af religious minorities in Afghanistan. We have very few people left from this very noble mi minority, the Hindus, the, the, the Sikh uh, community. And one of their religious uh, 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 centers was uh, unfortunately attacked with, uh, by suicide attackers, uh, killing uh, many people there, women and children, and from three-year-old child to, to everyone. So unfortunately, the, the, the enemies of Afghanistan or those who are using terrorism as a weapon have not really taken this serious either uh, in terms of at least stopping their, whatever the purpose of this war is to stop it until uh, this uh, crisis is over. Uh, as I speak to you, I'm also reading the news from Balkh province where uh, an attack happened and several civilians have been targeted uh, by Taliban again. Uh, this also doesn't mean that the, the, the side of the government is not uh, organizing attacks in a defensive mood uh, or offensive. They are, there has also been uh, operation, military operations happening. Uh, and finally, sort of coming to the, to the, to the question of peace process. Um, unfortunately, there are lots of back and forth on this. Uh, the coronavirus obviously did not help because the interactions, the personal interactions is limited now, no mobility, no, no travels. Uh, but some, some developments have been made. For example, uh, the government announced uh, a delegation uh, peace uh, negotiator team. Uh, and at the same time, uh, at least there is a good news that there are a number of women also in this team. So it's not a men only team as it was worrying point. However, uh, the number of women are not still at least 50%, which is the desire of most of the women in Afghanistan uh, to have a 50% women delegation because we are equally or even we are affected worse than men in this war. So why not having more women in there? Um, uh, and then uh, one of the, 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 the sort of agreements between the US and Taliban was to, do the, to, to, to start with the release of prisoners. But the Afghan government, uh, because they were not part of this agreement or they were not part of this whole process, they have their own concerns about release of the prisoners, especially when we see, when we witness uh, the narratives from the Taliban side dominated by, we are coming back, we are going to punish you all, and there is no any kind of mercy to anyone. And then they are not only threatening, they are actually acting on it. And last week's incident was an example to that. So under these circumstances, it's, it's desirable to really uh, focus on uh, a particular demand. And I hope, I mean, using this platform, this amazing global platform of 3,000 people, I'm, I'm calling on everyone to put pressure on your governments uh, and on any channels that, can, that could sort of help listen uh, to a, a ceasefire to not only Afghanistan, but countries like Afghanistan who are at war who are uh, experiencing a, a, an already uh, severe humanitarian crisis uh, to be added with this situation. So I will end here and uh, hopefully we'll have time at later to um, have some recommendations and uh, answer some questions. Thank you. Well, th thank you, Orzla, and thank you for that uh, up-to-date uh, 
account of what's happening uh, in Afghanistan and how um, the humanitarian situation is playing out. And as you pointed out, it's true of many, many places under these very fragile circumstances. Uh, so I think that's important. It's also interesting that all of you now, the three speakers we've heard from, uh, have uh, emphasized the importance of data. Uh, and let's move now to Eric Schwartz, uh, who's the president of Refugees International, which is a humanitarian organization that advocates uh, for better support for refugees and the internally displaced. Uh, earlier, Eric served in a number of government roles as Assistant Secretary for Population, Refugees and Migration, uh, as well as Senior Human Rights and Humanitarian uh, official in the Clinton administration uh, and also as the um, UN Special Envoy uh, for the um, uh, tsunami, the Asian tsunami recovery uh, back in 2004. So Eric, um, the United Nations Secretary General called for a global ceasefire <clears throat> at this critical moment. Uh, to allow for uh, a humanitarian corridor, if you will, to be established uh, to deal with the, the emergency uh, that the COVID-19 represents. Uh, last week, Refugees International issued a major report on this crisis, um, and I hope you can share um, some of the, the, the recommendations that it contains, uh, both in terms of uh, containing uh, the um, the crisis as best one can and mitigating it uh, in the spread of this this contagion. So if you can briefly go into that, I, I think it would give us a good perspective. Uh, sure, uh, Milan, and um, thank you uh, so much. I I'm honored to be uh, with uh, such a group of distinguished uh, panelists. I'm also humbled by the knowledge that there are so many thousands of people on the front lines uh, trying to address this challenge. Um, uh, and I'm here uh, on behalf of our program, Refugees International's program on women and girls, and our, the head of that program, Devin uh, Cohn. Um, you did ask me to address this broad issue, uh, and, and I will. Um, but I, I also think I just have to validate the comments that so many people have been make, making, uh, several of the panelists, that it really comes down to the fact that even within vulnerable communities that are subject to structural injustice and structural inequality, um, there are structural injustices and structural inequalities uh, impacting uh, issues of gender. And uh, whether, uh, and, and women bear greater burdens and have less rights and less agency, whether that is reflected in the comment that David made about 70% of health and social sector uh, you know, community uh, uh, you know, um, being women, uh, uh, social uh, uh, health and social sector workers, whether it's reflected in the fact that we've seen this, in, in, we will see and are seeing an increase in gender-based violence and intimate partner violence, and whether it's the fact that Initially, the United States task force, and as far as I know, the UK task force uh, were put together without women. Um, these issues are profoundly important. And, and because you've asked me to talk about our broader conclusions, I will do that. Um, and, um, uh, um, and, and which obviously impact issues of gender as well. Um, and I, I would summarize um, the conclusions of our report which was issued, gee, I guess last Monday, a, a week ago Monday, uh, there were six fundamental uh, uh, recommendations, if you will. Um, uh, or uh, one, I think, maybe the most important one, which is whatever advocacy we do on this issue, whatever advocacy the humanitarian uh, community is concerned about on, on these issues, it, they, that advocacy, we have to ensure that that advocacy becomes a whole of United Nations effort and a whole of government and government's efforts, because it is not the humanitarians who make ultimately judgments on issues of access 
and levels of assistance. And so it is critically important that not only uh, to do you know, Filippo Grandi and Mark Lowcock and the senior humanitarian officials in the systems um, are advocating, but also uh, on these issues, we need the support, the active engagement of, um, of the Secretary General, but also at the national government level, at political leadership who, uh, who may not be uh, humanitarians. And, 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 uh, and, and if, if that doesn't happen, the, recommend, the, the five other recommendations I described are not going to be uh, implemented as effectively as possible. So the second uh, was the critical importance of the overall response being inclusive. Um, international assistance to address the pandemic must involve all po po uh, vulnerable populations. The majority of refugees and displaced persons who are outside of camps, but importantly, uh, the, the minority of refugees and displaced persons who are inside of camps. The assistance has to go to host communities, but the rhetoric and the policy and the programs have to be inclusive, both uh, instrumentally, because if it's not, the, you know, you're not addressing the problem fundamentally, but also morally. Um, third, uh, communication and flow of information has got to be as broad and open as possible uh, because uh, rumors and misunderstandings and ignorance flourishes when there isn't freedom of information. And we are seeing some challenges in that respect in some uh, areas, especially in camp light settings. Uh, my fourth recommendation of six is whether we're talking about, and all these things are important, the building up of testing, rapid testing and surveillance, uh, decongestion of, and quarantine capabilities, uh, the deployment of medical personnel, supplies, personal protective equipment, uh, the prioritization of hygiene and wash related interventions. All of these are important, but this fourth recommendation has to do with the importance of engaging and giving local actors uh, an agency. And connected to that is the importance of ensuring generous support uh, for international and national non-governmental organizations. Uh, humanitarian advocates have said that 30%, as much as 30% of the UN appeal uh, should go uh, to the non-governmental community. And this is a test uh, not only to multilateral organizations, but to international NGOs to make real the rhetoric about um, providing resources at the national and local level to non-governmental organizations, uh, because they're the ones who know what's going on. Um, and my fifth of six recommendations, which you know, is the strong view of the public health community um, and the protection community and the rights community, is just don't detain and deport asylum seekers. Um, it, 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 the detention of asylum seekers, there are tens of thousands detained in our own country, in the United States. It just doesn't make any sense. First of all, it's in conflict with international uh, refugee law. And, um, but in addition, it increases the risks, not only uh, to asylum seekers, uh, and, 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 but also to those who have responsibilities in governments around asylum seekers. And, and so, uh, so we, we have to, Governments should not be detaining and deporting um, uh, asylum seekers. And then finally, and connected to, to, uh, to, to my fifth suggestion, my sixth suggestion is that governments have a deep obligation, even in circumstances where we need to put in place legitimate controls on, on borders, we have to have um, uh, mechanisms that ensure that those who have fear of persecution, um, fear of torture, uh, fear of return to violence, um, are not going to be forcibly returned uh, to their countries, um, to their to their countries of origin. And um, I'm sure there are other points, but if you ask me what sort of the six elements of our uh, refugee, displaced persons rights desiderata, that would be it. Thank you so much, Eric, and uh, also for
reminding us of the importance of, of leadership and inclusive leadership uh, to uh, really carry out uh, all the other things that have to be done. Uh, I'm gonna uh, say goodbye to, uh, to David uh, because he had a hard stop uh, to go on and do another event um, and uh, move on uh, with the, uh, uh, our final panelist and then our questions. Uh, Mavic Cabrera Balaza is the uh, CEO of the Global Network of Women Peace Builders, uh, which is a coalition of civil society organizations supporting frontline women peace builders uh, working in mostly conflict affected areas. Uh, Mavic has been just an extraordinary leader on the implementation of Security Council Resolution uh, 1325 in the development and implementation of national action plans. Uh, to go with that, uh, she has been uh, just in, intrepid uh, in bringing in the voices and the agency of women at the ground level. Uh, so Mavic, let's, let's end this formal part of the program um, by your telling us um, how are women and, and young leaders as well, uh, peace builders all, uh, working to counter um, COVID-19 um, on these front lines in these very difficult places uh, that we have been hearing about. Um, and, and perhaps on a note of hope, uh, we need hope right now. Uh, what are you hopeful about to move us forward? Thank you, Ambassador Verveer. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Let me start by giving a brief background about our organization, the Global Network of Women Peace Builders. We're an international women's coalition that works in different countries affected by violent conflicts to effectively implement the United Nations Security Council resolutions on women, peace and security in partnership with the United Nations governments, including local authorities and leaders such as governors, mayors, indigenous leaders, faith leaders, local police and military, but our most important partners are women and youth peace builders in local communities. I'd like to speak about what we have learned regarding the gendered impact of COVID-19 pandemic in the countries we work in, and some of them are, uh, have been uh, already referred to by my fellow panelists and, and Milan herself. Uh, so in our work in countries such as Armenia, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Indonesia, Philippines, and Ukraine, um, we have learned that um, uh, COVID-19 has a disproportionate impact on women and girls. The mandatory isolation and social distancing policies have aggravated domestic violence as they trap women at home with their abusers, while women's shelters and domestic violence hotlines are struggling to meet demand. As primary caregivers, for the sick and elderly, women face greater risk of exposure to COVID-19. Additionally, women comprise the majority of health and social care workers. The impact of COVID-19 pandemic is much more catastrophic in situations of armed conflict, in situations where there's already ongoing uh, violence and humanitarian emergencies. The travel and mobility restrictions have severely inhibited the delivery of relief and essential services and humanitarian aid to vulnerable groups, including women, young women and girls, people with disabilities, the internally displaced, and refugees. So what are women and youth peace builders doing? In Armenia, Georgia, Indonesia, and the Philippines, women and youth peace builders are making face masks and distributing them, distributing them along with food packages to the elderly, people with disabilities, and vulnerable populations. In the Philippines, our young women leaders are now working to distribute what we call dignity kits, a kits that con you know uh, uh, that uh, contain sanitary pads, uh, soap. Uh, toothbrush, etc., uh, which are often not included in the in the usual relief packages. Uh, in Ukraine, uh, women civil society have set up phone and text networks wherein they make phone calls and send text messages to women who are vulnerable to physical, mental, and emotional abuse to let them know that support is available. And a lot of times, just listening and talking to the women who are in abusive relationships uh, 
make a big difference, uh, especially in this time of uh, isolation. Uh, such assistance is targeted to conflict-affected areas, such as Nagorno-Karabakh, which is on the border of Armenia and Azerbaijan, in certain areas of Mindanao in the Philippines, and in Kherson, Ukraine, which is the state or, or oblast that is uh, closest to Crimea. And with your permission, I just would like to announce that we have set up a GoFundMe campaign to support the women and youth peace builders' rapid response to COVID-19 in local communities. It's on uh, the Global Network of Women's Facebook and Twitter pages and also on our website. Now, what is the impact to conflict-affected situations and peace processes broadly? In Colombia, uh, where killings of human rights defenders and activists has increased even after the signing of the peace agreement between the government and the FARC or the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, the COVID-19 outbreak has aggravated these threats as the government has reduced the protective measures offered to human rights defenders, making them more vulnerable than ever before. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, the COVID-19 pandemic has put an additional strain on the, on the country, especially in the eastern part of the country where there's an ongoing conflict, as many aid workers were evacuated. There are also serious concerns over the possible closure of the borders between, uh, in Burundi and Rwanda, which often serve as supply routes, uh, including especially for humanitarian aid. And in the Philippines, uh, even though there's a ceasefire agreement with the Communist Party, the security-oriented response to COVID-19 can easily lead to violation of the ceasefire agreement since it is mainly the police and the military that are enforcing the lockdown orders and mobilized to implement the government response to the COVID-19 crisis. So people in the Philippines are demanding to be tested, but instead they are being arrested. Um, and and um, uh, urban poor communities that are uh, uh, demanding relief packages, especially food, are, are being detained. Um, the COVID-19 outbreak has unique dimensions in conflict-affected situations, and women and youth peace builders' profound understanding of those dimensions makes it absolutely necessary for them to be at the core of the decision-making on the response to this crisis. They are the ones who will bring what is needed most, which is a response that is founded on human rights and feminist values. Clearly, what we're seeing is that while governments remain undecisive or are caught up in their politicking, women and youth peace builders in local communities are out there doing life-saving work, securing the gains of their peace-building efforts, and preventing the outbreak, outbreak of violence. So there is, that's where I see hope, Milan. Uh, the boldness, the audacity of women and youth peace builders to, uh, you know, to be the first responders. And, and, and they're in that good position because they know the local community as well, because they live there. They, they do their work there, and, and they know the people. They, they have, they have first-hand knowledge of the situation, and they know the solutions. They offer solutions. So it's not just about, you know, our, the, our, or their right to participate, but it's also the smart solution to this um, growing crisis. So I'll stop here and look forward to the comments and questions from our audience members. Well, thank you, Mavic. And I think it's, it's important for all of us to be reminded of, of what's happening uh, even as we participate in this discussion, what's happening with, with those brave people on the ground. Um, and they are indeed the hope uh, for getting through this crisis and so much more. Uh, we're going to go over, so I'm going to tell our, our listening audience, our viewing audience, that we will uh, go over our time to take some of the questions. Uh, we have large numbers of questions. Uh, we won't be able to get to many of them. Uh, but I'm going to ask our, our, our technical uh, director to perhaps bunch them together, if you could give us um, three at a time, and then whoever of the panelists who wants to take them, uh, take them. And please be as brief as you can in your responses, because 
uh, the numbers here are growing in terms of the questions. So uh, please, Allie. Yeah, we've gotten multiple questions about the disproportionate death rate for men and how that fits into this gendered approach and also disparate impacts on people of different races and ethnicities. For example, we're seeing alarming data emerging about substantially elevated mortality rates among African Americans in the US. So the question for all panelists is how do we have an inclusive and intersectional approach? Um, we'll start there. Okay, so the, the, the disproportionate mortality rates that appear to be uh, happening with respect to men, the racial inequalities and how those impact. Anybody want to take that? Um, Eric? Yeah, um, no, I, I, I see uh, Mavic. Mavic? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you. I think the first thing that uh, we need to do or, or the decision makers need to do is to look at the uh, humanitarian clusters that exist at the national level or, or in local levels uh, where, where there are uh, um, humanitarian emergencies. And uh, many of these uh, humanitarian clusters uh, that, that, that serve as coordinating mechanisms for response to crisis are, are not inclusive of women, especially local women. And uh, gender, even though it's uh, increasing, uh, increasingly integrated in, in policies, uh, including in the outcomes of the humanitarian summit, uh, and the grand bargain uh, in 2016, it doesn't happen at, you know, on the ground. It's still mainly on paper. And uh, the response to uh, humanitarian emergencies also does not integrate a women peace and security perspective. Uh, and uh, so what, what we're uh, recommending is a conflict, uh, a, a gender responsive, conflict and crisis sensitive analysis of how humanitarian emergencies are, are implemented. And this, the, the other point that I would like to make is um, for the donor community to be willing to take risks. And often it's, uh, it, the risk is not taken on women's rights organizations that you know they're small they don't have enough uh, experience in in managing funds especially big funds well we are in an emergency uh it's it's a matter of life and death what greater risk can be you know uh uh can what greater risk can 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 we uh, consider other than um uh, trusting the women, the local populations who are there, who know the problem and who know the solutions. Anybody else? Well, I, maybe? I, please. Okay, thanks, Eric. Um, I wanted to say a couple of things about the question on a more inclusive and intersectional approach. First, I think on the issue of uh, men having higher morbidity and mortality rates under COVID, um, I think to me, this just reinforces the need for data, right? Mm -hmm. And I think on the men's issue, we know that um, actually we still don't know why this is the case, right? In Wuhan, in the early findings, it appeared, there appeared to be a link between excessive tobacco usage and the morbidity and mortality rates. But since that trend has continued, uh, it's actually something that deserves further investigation. I think that's a separate issue from the fact that uh, racial inequalities are now coming to the fore. And certainly I think the impact on women is simply a reflection of the fact that COVID is actually perpetuating and throwing into sharp relief existing social and economic inequalities. And so when we see this, what we're really seeing is um, how deeply inequality is embedded in our economic and social systems today. So I think to address this, we need to do three things. First, we need, and I emphasize this over and over again, sex and gender disaggregated data so that we have powerful, 
compelling arguments for policymakers. Number two, we need to keep women's organizations alive, focused on this issue. That means donors have to keep funding women's organizations because they are facing extinction in certain places. And number three, we have to push for women at the table. I, uh, I was looking at how many health ministers today are women. And out of 193 countries, only 47 ministers are female. So how are they going to, how are the rest of these ministers actually thinking about women's issues? When you look at how many ministers of planning worldwide who are going to be managing some of these responses are women, there are less than half of the 190 are female. And when you look at ministers of finance, who are the most powerful ministers in most cabinets who are dispersing this money and keeping uh, economies alive, 25 out of 193 countries have female finance ministers. So, you know, the, to me, this just says decision making is simply not women uh, strong enough. And we therefore need to find alternative ways, which is civil society organizations, as well as business and private sector as partners. Over. I think we'll go into one more round of questions. Um, Ali? Yeah. Uh, so we'll have three questions here. The first one is from Jamie Vernalde from PAI. Um, she's asking if we can speak to the rise of conservative populism globally and how this trend will impact the COVID response, particularly for sexual and reproductive health and rights in humanitarian emergencies. The second is from Selin Taftaf um, with the Middle East Technical University in Turkey. She's asking, do you think staying at home due to Corona virus can actually lead towards a change in the gender division of labor? Fathers are doing home-based work and they're undertaking more domestic work. Um, will gender norms possibly change? And the last question is from Samuel Schiffer asking, can you speak about the intersection of technology surveillance and public health? and the unique mm -hmm. implications it may have for women and other marginalized populations. Good, I think the questions represent just the vast nature of the complexity uh, of this issue. Let's start with uh, Anita, if we could, um, on the, um, the staying at home, Anita. So, the specific issue on? It, do you think that with, with uh, the gender roles might change or the burdens might change uh, with more uh, men staying at home now and helping in the homeschooling and, and perhaps making contributions in other ways to the care burden? So uh, I'm hopeful that uh, this experience of uh, you know, forced uh, isolation will actually make men realize how much work women actually do. I have to say that I think um, we do need more awareness raising and social mobilization around this. So UN Women will be launching uh, probably next week our new campaign, which is He for She at Home, which is really designed to address uh, the stereotypes of women carrying most of the burden. And I think I have seen lots of articles about women uh, speaking up about the fact that, you know, they now have five jobs at home. And actually, I see this in our own staff members, because the people who are really struggling with uh, being under quarantine and lockdown are the women who have young children at home, homeschooling, and also taking on other typical care burdens. But I also want to address this issue of men taking on work at home for women in the informal economy and for migrant workers. I mean, this is not an issue in the sense that the real issue right now for so many women in the world is basic food security and starvation. When I look at what's going on in India with the lockdown, the issue for women there is, you know, the burden of care has just multiplied. And, and on top of that, you now have the burden of actually having to worry about food and feeding your family. So I think, you know, when we talk about the burden of care, we have to have a nuanced approach which distinguishes between those privileged women who can actually be at home 
and um, you know, worry about the burden of care there and how these stereotypes can change for them. But we also have to think about the vast majority of poor women in the world for whom the burden of care has always been unequal, but has actually gotten much, much worse translating into an issue of basic survival. Anybody else want to, Eric, please? Yeah, I'll comment on two of the questions. Um, and I'll interpret the question about the rise of conservative, um, conservatism as uh, more the rise of, of nationalist ideology. Um, and, um, and yes, I'm, I'm very concerned about that um, in terms of uh, uh, um, build, the building of, of barriers uh, that are not going to easily come down. Uh, uh, barriers to easy movement across borders, to protection, to asylum, that are not going to you know, be easy to, 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 that won't easily come down after this crisis is over. That's a real concern. And secondly, uh, I'm also concerned, it's not specifically this issue, but I'm deeply concerned about um, uh, women's uh, access to sexual and reproductive health. Um, uh, we have terrible uh, uh, foreign aid laws uh, in the United States on that. And I think this crisis may create, I, I hesitate to use the word opportunities, um, but um, uh, you know, openings for uh, some uh, mischievous activity in that regard. So I'm very concerned about that. Um, and then I want to just mention that you know, uh, the, uh, I saw one of the questions really is, you know, will there be some hope for increased use of um, evidence-based analysis on these kinds of challenges. And um, there uh, you can be hopeful, but if you watch the daily clown show uh, at the White House on this issue, you can also have reasons uh, to be concerned. And, um, and so I think that is a, a battle that has yet to be uh, won uh, on, on the use of evidence-based analysis in policymaking. Thank you. Mavic, did you wanna make a point? Yes, uh, related to the question on the rise of conservatism. Um, governments, uh, populist governments are taking advantage of the situation to demand more powers uh, or emergency powers as they relate to it in, in the guise of uh, COVID-19 response. So it's not just conservatism, but outright misogynist, um, um, misogynist leadership. And uh, it is, um, we are very worried about uh, services, much, much less services for women and girls, especially uh, uh, sexual and reproductive uh, health care. Uh, it is already very little in many countries, and, and we're very worried that this would be uh, further denied. And uh, it's, you know, uh, health, and plus the fact that health, health institutions are not just weakened, but many of them are, we see them failing. Uh, to respond to the needs of uh, the populations. Thank you. No, I'm sorry that uh, time has elapsed and um, uh, even though we went over, we couldn't get to many, many of the questions. Uh, but I wanna say that the, this discussion uh, will live on the Georgetown website uh, for Women, Peace and Security uh, and under events, uh, so it can be um, accessed there. Uh, today's discussion was the first in a series on the gendered impacts of COVID-19. So stay tuned for others uh, that will be hosted by our partners. I wanna thank each and every one of our panelists. Uh, I know that the burden on your own time is uh, significant these days and in more ways than uh, each of us can understand because of the responsibilities you have so thank you for joining us for your perspectives and for the work you do uh, every day. And I wanna thank our viewers for joining with us. You know, while we practice social distancing or physical distancing um, to stop the spread of this terrible contagion, we also need to reach out to each other uh, in a spirit of solidarity across the global community. And that's what each and every one of you represents. May you stay well. May you continue to work uh, for a better world uh, and one that hopefully will be based on protecting, always protecting uh, the human dignity of each and every person. So stay well, stay healthy, carry on, and thank you again for all that you do. <laughs>
Thank you, Milan and everyone. Thank you, Milan. Thank you. Thank you, Milan.